Uh, I'm here today with uh, Bernard Carr, right? Uh, my name is Jim Hartle. I'm from the University of California in Santa Barbara, uh, visiting Cambridge at the moment. Uh, I work in uh, a variety of subjects, uh, but my most recent interests are the quantum mechanics of the very early universe. This is Bernard Carr from Queen Mary College in uh, London. Uh, and he is probably the most knowledgeable person in the world about what's the main subject of this interview, fine-tuning. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to move on just to the first question. Bernard, what is fine-tuning, right? Uh, how many fine-tunings are there? And why should we be worried about this? Well, first of all, Jim, it, it's important to appreciate that there are many different types of tuning. Mm -hmm. And one needs to make a clear distinction between these. Uh, there are what are called the, the weak tunings, or if you like, the, the weak anthropic principles, since people use the word anthropic principle in association with these tunings. And that simply says that there is a selection effect on when and where we observe the universe. So in some sense, that's non-controversial. It's, it's, it's a very natural implication of, of pure logic. And I might give the, the simplest example of all, the very famous example, which is the one that Bob Dickey gave in the 1960s, where you asked the question, well, why is the universe as, as big as it is? Uh, well, of course, that comes down to the question of why is it as old, old as it is? We know it's 14 billion years, and that means its size is roughly 14 billion light years. Now, the, the sort of purely mechanistic argument just says, well, the universe just happens to be 14 billion years old, and therefore its size is something like 14 billion light years, the distance that light has traveled since the Big Bang. But Dick, he gave another argument. He said, no, we can only be here be because we are made of em elements, chemicals like carbon, which are made in stars. But that can only, those chemicals can only be produced if stars have gone through their main sequence phase and exploded. And that takes roughly speaking, 10 billion years, because stars have to go through their hydrogen burning phase before they explode, and roughly speaking, that takes 10 billion years. On the other hand, if you waited much longer than 10 billion years, all the stars would have burnt out, so there wouldn't be any light, which is obviously crucial for life, and therefore that suggests that life, we can only be asking questions about the universe when it's roughly 10 billion years old. So it's not saying the universe doesn't exist, when it's not 10 million years old. It's just saying we wouldn't be here asking questions about it. So all that's saying is that our presence in the universe imposes a selection effect on, on where we actually, when we actually exist after the Big Bang. And obviously there are similar selection effects on where we exist. We have to exist close to a star in the habitable zone and things like that. So those are examples of, of what you might call the weak anthropic principle, where you say we accept all the constants of nature and the laws of nature, and then we just have a selection effect on when and where we observe. Now, much more controversial are the, what's sometimes called the strong anthropic principle arguments. And, and these say that, well, actually, even the constants of nature themselves are fine-tuned for the existence of observers. Now, what are these constants? Because, of course, there are many, many constants in physics and a lot of them are inter interdependent anyways. But so you've got to decide, well, which are in some sense the, the fundamental constants. Now, very often the, the fundamental constants are the dimensionless numbers that arise. And in particular, we have the four forces of nature and they are associated with coupling constants. So the most famous one is the fine structure constant, sometimes called alpha, which basically describes the, the strength of the force between two protons the electric force between two protons. But then there's the gravitational force, and that's described by a gravitational fine structure constant, sometimes called alpha g. And that's tiny. I mean, that's roughly 10 to the minus power 40, where alpha is just 1 over 137, 10 to the minus 2. And so the gravitational force between two protons is far, far less than the, the electric force, but of course we know on a large scale objects are electrically neutral, which is why gravity dominates on the large scale. But then there's the, the weak fine structure constant, which is sometimes called alpha w, and that's got a value of something like 10 to the minus 10. And then there's the strong coupling constant, which 
is alpha s, and which is something like 10. So these are your four fundamental coupling constants which describe the four forces of nature. Now, of course, one would like to think your final theory of physics is going to explain what those coupling constants are, but actually our current fundamental theory doesn't tell you what those values are. They're sort of put into the theory as an assumption. But what is surprising is that there are relationships, fine tunings between these constants, which are required in order that we should be here. Now, when I say required for us to be here, what I mean by that is that you need to have interest in chemistry, you need to have, you need to have stars, and you need to have galaxies. And, and in some sense, those conditions seem to require these unexplained constants. Now, I'll just give you a simple example. I told you how we are here because the heavy elements which are made in stars get disseminated when they explode a supernova and eventually incorporated into planets and people. But the question is, why is a, a supernova able to explode? Well, when the, the core collapses after its evolution, main sequence evolution, it generates a surge of neutrinos and the neutrinos pour out through the, the star and basically blow off the envelope. That's what's caused isn't the supernova. Now, but the neutrinos, of course, are interacting with the, the matter in the envelope through weak interactions. If the weak interactions were too strong, the neutrinos would just get trapped in the core. Okay? They would never get out, blow off the surface. If it was too weak, they would go all the way through the surface and, and wouldn't blow off the envelope either. Now, it turns out from straightforward physics that there is a relationship between alpha w, the weak fine structure constant, and alpha g, the gravitational fine structure constant, which roughly speaking is that alpha g is the fourth power of alpha w. Now that's clearly correct because if I take 10 to the minus 10 and take the fourth power, it's 10 to the minus 40. That's required for supernovae. And there's no doubt that relationship is required for supernovae, but the point is, nothing explains why that relationship should be true. In other words, there's no theory of fundamental physics which says alpha g is the fourth power of alpha w. There's another famous relationship, even more striking, between the gravitational fine structure constants and the electric fine structure constant, which is alpha g is the 20th power of alpha. Now again, alpha is 10 to the minus 2 to the so if I take the 20th power of that, I get 10 to the minus 40. Now, again, that relationship is not predicted, but it is required. Now, it's required because in, in some sense, which is a bit technical, you need that relationship in, in order to have what are called radiative stars and convective stars. And it's the, convective, it's the radiative stars which become supernova and the convective stars which are associated with planets. So it's quite a technical argument. It goes back to Brandon Carter. But the point is, there is that relationship between those two constants which are required in order that we can have radiative and convective stars. And then there are relationships between the strong coupling constant and the electric coupling constant which are required in order to have interest in chemistry. If the obviously a nucleus represents a sort of balance between electric forces and, and, and the strong forces and if just a, a small increase in the strong force would mean that you wouldn't you wouldn't have the basically everything would go into deuterons at the Big Bang and things like that and we wouldn't have hydrogen which gives long range stars. If alpha was a little bit smaller then you wouldn't have chemistry at all. If alpha s the strong force was a little bit weaker you wouldn't have chemistry at all. So that, those are just some examples of why you need to have these fine tunings, which can often be sort of expressed analytically, in order for us to be here. Now, there are other parameters as well. There, there are cosmological parameters. There's things like the photon to baryon ratio. There's the, there's the amplitude of the fluctuations, which eventually give rise to galaxies. The number of spatial dimensions, the number of time dimensions, and most famous of all, of course, is the cosmological constant, which maybe we will talk about separately because that would be a, a, a big discussion itself. But the, the main point I'm trying to make is that there are these relationships between the various constants of nature, in particular the coupling constants, but also other cosmological constants, 
which are simply not explained by normal physics. So normal physics has done a wonderful job in explaining you know, the huge variety of structures which exist in the universe from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic scale and, and it's explained the history of the Big Bang and things like that, but it doesn't explain these fine tunings. And what it ultimately comes down to is, are some of the constants of nature, such as the cosmological parameters, are they going to be uniquely determined by a final theory of physics, or are they just going to be what we call you know, contingent parameters? They just are because that's what the, the initial conditions of the universe gave us. In other words, the statement would be, the, the theory of the Big Bang isn't going to tell you what the photon to baryon ratio is, it's just you could have different universes with different values of the photon to baryon ratio, but we know it has to be constrained for us to exist. So the question comes down ultimately, does our, which of these parameters, constants of physics, are uniquely going to be specified by the final theory, and which are going to be free? And we just don't know the answer to that question a priori. All we can say is that current physics has not predicted these values uniquely. And if you want them to be some freedom to have this fine-tuning, you don't want the final theory of physics to predict them uniquely, because if they're predicted uniquely, there's no way you've got the freedom to have this anthropic selection. And then it would just become an amazing coincidence that the constants which the final theory gives us happen to be appropriate for life. So that's rather a long summary of all the various fine-tunings, but maybe that's something to start with. Um. So do you think that the uh, final theory has to have a mechanism for these constants to vary in some way, as for example in the multiverse idea? Well, one would, I would say that if you're going to invoke a multiverse, you have to have some mechanism which is going to allow them to have some freedom. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, you, you, ideally you want to have a theory which is going to give you some distribution for these parameters because I mean if there's no the only way you can sort of test this model in a probabilistic way is if you have some prediction as to what the distribution is I mean let's take a very simple example let's take the cosmological constant mm -hmm. now I didn't talk about the cosmological constant tuning because it's, it's such a big topic but it is the most striking mm -hmm. tuning of all and as you know the the most natural value for the cosmological constant will be the Planck density. Mm -hmm. The actual value of the cosmological constant, which we've known for 20 years, uh, is causing the universe to accelerate. The actual value of the cosmological constant is, is less than the natural value by a factor of 10 to the 120, which is why you've got this amazing fine-tuning. Now, of course, in the old days, one used to say, well, our final theory of physics will make lambda exactly zero, which would have been nice if you had a theory, because you wouldn't have anything to explain. The fact that lambda is not exactly zero, but is nevertheless tiny compared to the natural value, is a huge mystery, because not only have you got to explain why it's so small, you've got to explain why, at the present epoch, mm -hmm. its value is just comparable to the matter density, which in general would only happen at one particular epoch, you know, because they scale with time in a different way. So there's, there's sort of two fine tunings in some sense. Now, as you know, one explanation for that was the explanation given by Weinberg, where he says, well, if we have a, if our model, if we've got, if you like, a multiverse with a range of values of lambda, then if lambda was too big, we wouldn't make galaxies. And so he had a, a nice argument, a very famous argument, which says that, well, if we have our, if our final theory is going to give a huge range of values of lambda, going all the way, if, if you like, from plus to minus 10 to the power 120, compared to what we've got, then there will naturally be an anthropic fine-tuning because if lambda was too big, there would be no galaxies. And if there were no galaxies, there would be no people. And so that's an example of an anthropic argument. And this, remember, was made before they actually detected the acceleration of the universe. So it was, in a sense, a, an anthropic prediction. And in, in fact, I think I heard Weinberg once say that he only got the paper accepted for publication because he said here was a possible way of disproving the anthropic principle. But actually, of course, in the end, it, it turned out to be a, a beautiful prediction, which was, roughly speaking, confirmed. But the point is, though, that 
this model is all based on the assumption that you d your final theory of quantum gravity, whatever it is, or your final theory, is going to allow you to have a wide distribution. And of course, we have no idea what that distribution would be. I mean, the most natural assumption is that the distribution of lambda would be have a uniform distribution all the way from plus to minus the Planck density. But of course, there's no reason for that. It might have some bumps in it. But the one at least has to assume it's going to be relatively smooth over the range, which includes the actual value. I mean, what would be very unnatural would be to say that it just happens that the prediction is going to be that lambda is going to have a peak. The distribution, the probability distribution will have a peak just at the value we've got. To me, that would be very unnatural because that's what, that's what we're actually trying to, to explain. And, and so I would say that to answer your question, it's crucial that whatever the theory is, it has to produce a distribution. Does that mean it's crucial to have a multiverse of some kind? Well, then the question is, is the only way to have a distribution of a constant to have lots of different universes? And For different would, universes, could you clarify what that Well, means? The, the point is there are different models of the multiverse here. So in some sense, one has to explain what one means by a multiverse. You know, the simplest type of multiverse simply says that we know that we only observe out to the horizon, particle horizon, which is roughly speaking 14 billion light years. Actually, it's three times that, isn't right. it? It's 40 billion light years. But roughly speaking, it's of order the light travel time from the Big Bang. We know the universe doesn't end there. So we know there are patches. There are other Hubble volumes beyond our horizon. So that's indisputable. On the other hand, it's not clear why those patches would be any different from us in terms of the values of the constants. So we do have to have some model in which the constants, such as the cosmological constant, are going to vary. Now, that does, of course, happen naturally in the inflationary scenario, because in the inflationary scenario, you, you, you can get different bubbles in which the constants, including the cosmological constant, may naturally vary. And then our observable patch just happens to be a small part of a bubble. Mm -hmm. and, and that you might even want to invoke the, the string landscape scenario, which comes out of string theory, which says that you, these bubbles each correspond to different vacuum states, mm -hmm. which, which have different values of the cosmological constant. So that's a particular example of a scenario which comes from string theory, which says, yes, we do naturally produce a multiverse in the sense of the different bubbles and those different bubbles have different values of the cosmological constant. And maybe, if they have different values of the cosmological constant, they'll also have different values of the, of the other constants as well, the coupling constants. We don't really know that because we don't, don't have a very good theory which relates all these different constants, but at least there would be a hope that each of these bubbles would have different values of the, of the constants. Um, but if you ask, of course, there are different versions of the multiverse scenario. They're not, the inflation isn't the only one. You can have, um, you have the brain, the brain picture where you think of our universe as a brain in a higher dimensional bulk and then people say, well, maybe we can have lots of brains and there's another version. And I suppose you might in principle have different values of lambda in the brains. Or you could simply have cyclic models, you know, there are cyclic models where the universe expands and recollapses and many, many cycles, and maybe the constants and even the cosmological constant gets changed in every bounce, so that would be another scenario. So um, I, I don't think one would say that the you uniquely have to invoke uh, inflation, but that's a nice way of doing it. But, but I would say in general, the most natural way of interpreting these fine tunings is to say that you do have different universes which correspond to different bubbles and in inflation, but different interpretations in, in other scenarios, to, to, so that you can have a selection effect. Because once you've got this, this collection of this ensemble of different universes or different bubbles, you simply say, well, we necessarily exist in one of the bubbles where life can arise.